appreciate the, uh, the other song. I appreciate all God's doing. Amen. Amen. Somebody like to praise the Lord tonight. Amen. Somebody else. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Somebody else. Amen. Amen. Somebody else just want to thank him. Missionary left here uh, this morning told us that they go to a lot of churches. And he said, We've not, we don't find very many like this one. And uh, so we appreciate that. Amen. Brother Jerry came in tonight and said he wondered if it's still dripping from the ceiling. Uh, God just blessed us this morning. We need them kind of services. Amen. We need to be on the mountaintop every now and then, and we appreciate the Lord doing that. Somebody else just want to praise him. Thank you. All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. And we'll look at verse 10. Let's all stand while we read God's precious holy word. Hebrews 13, verse number 10. The book of Hebrews was written to who? Hebrew people that had been saved. Hebrew people that had been saved that had the pull of Judaism still on them. And as Paul, which I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, as he wrote the book of Hebrews, he was trying to tell them there's a better way. It's not uh, the Jewish temple. It's not the uh, Jewish uh, customs, but it's Jesus. And that new and living way that, that he talks about in the book of Hebrews, he's telling them that we have something better and we need not be drawn away uh, from things that are taking the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in verse 10 with me. The Bible says we have an altar. Amen. Whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the camp, uh, without the gate, I'm sorry. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Let's pray. Father. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. We pray, God, that you'd give us uh, wisdom tonight. And, Lord, that you'd speak to every heart. And, Lord, if there's one here that's not saved, Lord, I pray that you'd show them the wonderful gospel tonight. The gospel, Lord, that's what gets folks saved. And I pray, God, that you'd uh, let them see that. I pray for those that are saved by the glorious Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the sacrifice Jesus made and putting our faith and trust in that, I pray that you would help us to grow a little tonight. And I pray, pray Lord, that you would help uh, that growth, that spiritual growth, bring us into a place where we never want to reproach the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. I pray, God, that you give us glory tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to bring a message real quickly on uh, that we might bear His reproach now uh, as I said the Hebrews had to overcome some things first of all they had a different altar they didn't have that burnt offering anymore where animals were brought and killed and only lasted for a year they had the Lord Jesus Christ and a place to come and worship him 
And folks, I want you to know something. The altars will always be open at New Hope Baptist Church. As long as I'm here, as long as a lot of these folks are here, these altars will be open for folks to come and worship and pray and seek God. And so he said, we have a different offer, then, altar. Then he said, in uh, verse number 11, he said, for the bodies of those beasts, those uh, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. He said, we have a different sacrifice. The sacrifice is no longer that of animals. And the Bible tells us that that animal sacrifice was done away with. He tore that temple veil in two and uh, intended for that sacrifice to end because he was the last Lamb of God. He was the Lamb of God. And so he said that's a different sacrifice. He said we worship in a different place. The Jews, uh, they sought just to be in Jerusalem only. The temple was set inside Jerusalem, and the Bible says that Jesus was taken outside the gate and, and, and uh, crucified outside the gate, outside the camp. And listen to me, we're not serving uh, the, uh, uh, the sacrifices and the um, Old Testament economy that the Jews uh, 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 worshipped in, we have a new place to worship. And the Bible says it's called the church. And we come and worship in the church. But I'm going to tell you something. We can worship outside the church. We can worship in our homes. We don't have to come down here to have uh, time with God. And I hope you don't, uh, that's not the only place you come uh, to have time with God. He dwells in our hearts. Amen. And so we have a different place. And then he, then he tells them in verse number 13, let us go forth. Uh, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. We have a new life. Our life is different now that we've been saved. You show me a man whose life is not changed, I'll show you a man who's not really been saved. Amen. And I believe that with all my heart. I'm not talking about lordship salvation. I'm talking about the Bible says, Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a no... Uh, uh, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I, I mean, it's a new life. Your life is different. You don't think for yourself. You don't act on your own uh, actions. I mean, you uh, living for Jesus. That last part there, he said, let us go forth therefore. Because we have all these things new, let us go forth. We need to be walking forth and bearing his reproach. That means our life needs to be a separated life. And I want to preach just for a few minutes on separation and how that we ought to live a separated life. You say, well, preacher, I'm already separated. Then this ought to make you shout. Amen. And it ought not to bother you just in a little bit uh, to uh, hear some preaching on separation. We've got young people here that need to hear it. We've got older people here that need to hear it. We've got folks who are living half in and half out. Amen. And you need to decide whether you want one foot in and one foot out or both foot, feet in or both feet out. You can't live in the middle. Amen. And so the Bible tells us that very, very plainly. I want to share a couple things with you. This is not going to be very long, but I want to share a couple things with you. First of all, separation in Scripture is twofold. It's from and then unto. We live from that old world and that old life and that old man unto God. We are bearing His reproach. He has saved us and given us a new life, and thank God we're able to live that life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so separation means we've been separated from the world and from Satan and from all the things we used to live for, and now we're living unto Christ. It's not a hard thing, Brother Don, to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I want to live for you. Amen? Brother Don, I remember when Brother Don got saved. I remember it, I remember it vividly. Uh, I remember him coming down and getting saved, and I didn't know anything about Brother Don, but I began to see things. He began to come to church more. He began to, I mean, the moment he got saved, he, became, he came to church every time we had church. We went out to his house to visit him and to talk to him about getting baptized, and you know what he told me? The very first thing, you know what he told me? I need to get baptized. And I said, yes, I agree. When do you want to get baptized? And his and uh, Wanda had come from a different denomination, said she needs to get baptized too. And she said, well, we'll just get baptized together. And I believe it was the ne very next service that she got baptized. And so he already understood this is a new life. And I'm separated from the old things and moving on toward and unto God. Amen. I never will forget Don was a big bass fisherman. He's told this story in here. And he was a big bass fisherman, had a big bass boat, and went to tournaments and fished tournaments. 
And I'm going to tell you something about tournaments. They ain't nothing more than gambling. You're putting money down to win money. And that, that makes people mad. Same thing with coon hunting and everything else. If, if you put money down to win money, you are gambling. And so Don got that right off. I never even told him that. But he got in an argument with a fellow at the back of the church, or the fellow was arguing with him. And Don said, Preacher, what? And I didn't even know the conversation was going on. He said, Preacher, what is bass fishing I, or bass tournaments? I said, it's gambling. He turned and said, See, I told you. <laughs> he already had those things inside him. And he realized that we needed to live a separated life and began to separate and move out from the things of the world. Amen? Now, I'm going to talk about some things tonight, and I want you to listen closely. Amen? Listen. 2 Corinthians, turn there. You ought to mark this in your Bible. This is an important scripture for the child of God. Teenagers, you ought to mark this in your Bible. You ought to read it. It's something that you need to know. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Very, very important pa passage of scripture for the believer. This uh, young Christians, I'm going to bring, maybe next week, I'm going to bring a message on uh, dating and all that stuff, things that we need to know about that. Your children need to know about that, and you ought to make an effort to get here and get them here and make sure they hear that. Amen? That'll be next Sunday night. So you need to, you need to bring them here. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye. Who's the ye? It's the Christian. It's the child of God. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do Christians have a right to marry somebody that's not saved? You don't have a right to even date them. The Bible says you're unequally yoked together when you do that. Now, I'm going to give you something else. That means you're not to be unequally yoked together in business with an unbeliever. I have known people that tried that and it did not work. One won't sell beer and lottery tickets, the other one did not. And so the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So our life ought to be always watching that we're yoked together with believers. Because that's how we're going to get the presence of God. For, then listen to this. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, I'm going to say something here, and I want you to listen close, because I'm not trying to be mean and hard. If you're a part of an organization, a club, uh, a membership, a brotherhood, a whatever, and there's unbelievers mixed in in the membership, you're unequally yoked. Why would you want to be a part of that? Amen. Now somebody, that's right. Unequally yoked means unequally yoked. And so we cannot be, how would you be happy there? Now it doesn't mean you can't work for an unbeliever. And it doesn't mean you can't work in a place where there's unbelievers. But I believe you ought to be, you ought to be trying to be a part. I'm going I'm to say something to you. You, if you're married and you have children or you're married, period, and you go to church, how do you have time for something else? Aren't you dividing God's time when you do that? So I don't know how you would have time for a, a membership of anything else. And so you ought, to, you ought to be trying to focus all your attention on the house of God and the study of God's Word and the raising of your family. Amen. That's right. And then he says, what, uh, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with the idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, I told the story about this, but I don't believe that you're, if you're conscious that God is living in you, that you'll just go anywhere. Has anybody ever been, <coughs> has anybody ever been, what is that place? Outback. Hmm. I used to sing in bars. You know what Outback is? It's a bar where they eat. Their food's just famous. It's a bar. You sit down, and you're sitting right across from people drinking beer, drinking, out, drinking alcohol, and that just, that just vexes. 
I went there once and said, Lord, please forgive me. I won't go back. We went there once, and honest, we sat down. I looked across from me, and there was a guy with a something, tequila or something. And I looked at Pascal, and I said, we're leaving. We got up and left, and as we was walking across the parking lot, the waitress was saying, please wait, please wait. I said, we can't eat here. It's terrible. It's the same as going, to, I used to play music for those people. Boy, it's getting quiet. What fellowship have we with, what fellowship have we with that kind of business? We don't have fellowship with that kind of business. It's hard for us to sit in those places and be in those places because Christ dwells in us. Amen. Amen. Now listen. The Bible says, and it goes on to say in verse number 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Who's the them? The world. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The Bible says you're bought with a price, you're not your own. And so separation is from something, and then unto something. Amen? Then, secondly, separation lives in us threefold. Listen to this. It has to do with our desire. It has to do with our motive. And it has to do with our action. Now listen to this. Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. There must be a desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have that desire, you'll be fighting that all the days of your life. I told somebody just yesterday that uh, how you dress depends on your heart. Amen. And if the preacher has to, and the, and the husband has to, I never told Pascal how she, she was to dress. I wanted God to tell her that. And God told her that and showed her that. And, and, and we don't go around trying to tell people, well, Pascal dresses this way, so you ought to dress it. Well, that's not the standard. Pascal's not the standard. Amen? Miss Jean's not the standard. And certainly Hollywood is not the standard. The Bible is the standard. And it's her desire and it's my desire to dress the way the Bible says to. Amen? And uh, so it ought be, there ought to be a desire there to please God. And then there ought to be a motive. What is the motive for us being separated? that we might show others our Savior. That's our motive, is that we might show others our Savior. Somebody ought to look at us every now and then and say, hey, he's different. He's different now. He's, and, not, and not he's different, but he's different right here. He has a different motive, amen. And then there ought to be that action there. We must take up his cross and follow him. And so if we want to take up the cross and follow the Lord, there'll be a separation in us. Amen? Separation. Separation from and separation unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't have to be quiet. This is an amen sermon. Thirdly, and this will be the last point, separation proclaims something. Now listen to this. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. Now remember, we're bearing His reproach. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I'm going to tell you, there's many, plenty of people out there with a the philosophy that you ought to live with one foot in, one foot out. Now, Satan knows he can't get you all the way out, so he'll just have you put one foot in, one foot out. How, hey, wives, how would you like if your husband just had one foot in, one foot out of the marriage? How would you, wives, uh, husbands like it if your wife just had one foot in, one foot out? You wouldn't have no part of it. How would you like to have a doctor doing brain surgery on you, one foot in, one foot out? 
Huh? How'd you like your tax man doing your taxes? Just one foot in, one foot out. We don't want that anywhere else. Why would God want it? He expects us to walk after him and, and live in him. And, uh, and so uh, the separation of the saint proclaims that we're living for him. Amen. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting, off, uh, uh, in putting off the body of sins in the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, therein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, let me give you something. Now, I'm going to preach a message on this someday, so maybe you'll forget it by the time I get back to it. In the book of Ephesians, there's three stages of the believer. In the first couple of chapters, he talks about how we are seated. Sitting. Not S-E-A-T, seated. Now, when you take a child and you're, you're teaching that child, my Tennessee belt came out, I said learning that child. Teaching that child, you want them to sit there and listen to everything you say. Miss Jean, when we want the kids to pay attention to us over there, what's the first thing we do? Tell them to sit down. They'll sit down and they'll look up to us. Now, we're seated not uh, in our, in our, uh, amongst our own presence. We're seated in the presence of Christ. And he said he has, he has seated us in the heavenly. So we're seated. Then the Bible talks about in the middle chapters of, of the book of, of Ephesians on our walk. We're walking. But you can't walk until you first sit. And so once we have uh, gotten up from being seated, now let me put it this way. When we're seated, we're worshiping. When we're walking, we're working. And then the last part of Ephesians talks about our stand. And that's the warfare that we're in. And we're in a warfare against Satan. And Satan is trying to get your family. He's trying to get you. He's trying to get the church. He's trying to get the Bible. He's trying to get everything that's good. He's trying to get it. And so... We're in a walk. We're, we're complete in Him, but we're walking for Him. So we're proclaiming something. When we, when we uh, separate, we're proclaiming, Lord, you're all I need. Is the Lord all you need? He's all I need. He, because I'm complete in Him. I don't need anything else but Him. That's what Brother Don was saying. I don't need the bass tournament. That's what I lived for when I was lost, but I don't need them now because He's my Savior. And so we're completing him, and we'll want to separate, and we'll want to live right. I'm going to say something to you. I want you to listen. A real, true child of God will listen to what the, uh, what the preacher has to say. He'll listen to the Word of God. He'll listen to God, and he'll try to do what God wants him to do. Now, listen, I came out of a rough background. I came out of a life where anything goes. And God, one by one, began to show me things in my life that I needed to get rid of so that I could get closer to Him. Did He do that for you? He did that for me. And so when He began to show me those things and turn on the lights in my heart about those things, then I began to get rid of them. Not, I still struggle with some things. And, I, and uh, you know, I, I hate to tell you this, I've been saved 20 years. You've been saved 40 some years. You still struggle with stuff down the road. But God begins to show you things that you need to get rid of. And if you have a teaching spirit and a, and a heart to please God and you want to be complete in Him, you'll, you'll want to get rid of those things and you'll want to separate. Amen? Now let me give you some things. And I, I think this is important. Okay? okay? First of all, when we get saved, we don't need the music of this world because God's got His own music. Amen? And we don't have to take Amazing Grace and put it to the tune of a country song to get the children or to get the rednecks or whatever we're trying to get. We don't have to do that. I remember I was pastor in Bogle's Chapel. Some of y'all was probably there that morning. And they had a habit of inviting folks in and I wasn't really in control of that church. Wasn't really the pastor there. And uh, I'd come in one Sunday and there were some people up on the stage with their guitars. Brother Dom was there. 
And they sung Amazing Grace to the tune of House of the Rising Sun in the church service. I blew my stack. I preached on it just as soon as I got up, and them people never came back. I'm going to tell you something. House of the Rising Sun is a song about a house of ill repute. Why would you smutty God's Word to make it popular? Amen. I'm going to tell you something else. In that, well, I better, I better be careful. As my, in my pastor in life, I've seen musicians that were very talented and very good. On Saturday night, Brother Don, they'd go and play in the bars and the beer joints, and then they'd want to come in the house of the Lord and sing gospel music. I ain't furry. And if I find out you're doing that, you'll not be singing in this house of God. You can't walk down the middle. You can't walk singing country music. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I preached one time on music, and, and somebody came to one of the deacons and said, he's, surely he's not talking about country music. <laughs> Ernest Tubb and all them. And, and he come, the deacon come to me, and I said, you go back and tell him I'm talking about all of it. Country music, country music, rock and roll music came out of the heart of rebellion. Rebellion. Rebellion against God. Helter skelter. Rebellion against God. Country music came out of the bars and the beer joints of this land. And I'm going to tell you something. It has no place in the heart of the Christian. Amen. You cannot desire to sing in the choir and sing special songs in the house of God and be on Nashville Star or on, uh, what's that other one? Uh, uh, American Idol. Y'all did good. Everybody said, I don't, I don't know what. <laughs> you can't desire to be both. Yeah, who cares, really? Who? Well, I, I mean, God cares. God don't want our teenagers listening to both kind of music. And I'm going to tell you something. If they go home and they hear mom and dad doing it, or if they hear mom and dad have that desire, they're going to want to. And they're going to see no reason why they can't. We used to have people come to church right here that listen to uh, contemporary Christian music with its rock and roll beat and all that stuff, and they didn't see anything wrong with it. I came in here one night, and they were singing, I'm a believer, like the monkey song. You know, that's just, that don't mix. We've got to separate. And so we have to say, no, that's not what we're going to do. Our music's going to be different, amen? I don't need God, I don't need the world's music. Do you have to have the world's music? We don't have to have the world's music. We don't have to mix the world's music because God's got his own. Amen. I don't need the ways of the world. God's got his own ways. The Bible says his ways are higher than our ways. We don't have to live, dress, and look like the world. Amen. I don't have to lust after this world's wealth. God's got his own wealth. Amen. Listen to me. Right over here at, at each one of these stores, they sell a little ticket. And, uh, you know, every now and then that thing gets up to some, I don't even know. I'm like y'all. I, I don't know. It may gets up to $60 billion or something like that. You know what people do? They'll slip over there and they'll buy one. And you know what you did when you spent that two bucks or whatever it is on that lottery ticket? You looked up at God and said, I, I don't need you. Because they got $60 billion over here that I might can win. It's covetousness. It's covetousness. It's lusting after the world's wealth. You know what gambling does? It feasts off poor people. Rich people don't gamble. Rich people don't buy lottery tickets. People who, do, who have to live off food stamps buy lottery tickets. And so it's taking advantage of the world and kids listen to me ball boards uh, anything where you put money down to win money is gambling if you're playing putt putt and you say I bet you I'll get it in 10 tries for 25 cents you just coveted and gambled and told God I don't need you I can make my own everybody's trying to get wealthy everybody's trying to get rich you know why because the television tells you you gotta be Tells you you got to be. Tells you you can't live on what God has for you to live on. 
Amen? Has every Christian in this life been rich? <laughs> Paul wasn't rich. He left a rich life to become poor. The Bible said Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. And he had ever owned the cattle of a thousand hills and, and uh, uh, all the gold and silver in the, in the hills. And he didn't have a place to, he became poor and trusted God. And so we don't have to gamble. Amen? We don't have to gamble. If we buy lottery tickets, we ought to repent, throw them in the trash and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And, it, and J. Vernon McGee, said, he was funny if you ever listened to him. He said, evidently the Lord cannot trust me because he don't give me any money. And so, you know, if you're not wealthy, maybe it's because you couldn't handle being wealthy. Have you ever followed those people that won the lottery, how their lives went? Kill themselves and commit suicide because they can't handle the money. And so God wants us to live a simple life and serve Him. And some people He gives a little money to. And those people who He gives a little money to gives it back to Him. And He uses them to, to if they're right with God. And so we don't have to gamble for our money. Amen. Amen. We don't have to lust after booze and things to take our emotions away from us. God put emotions in our hearts so that we might seek Him. And if we run to the bottle and to the uh, drugs of this world, and I'm going to tell you something else. Uh, there's, there's more than the illegal drugs going on out here. Folks are getting hooked on uh, uh, drugs given to them by a doctor. And they're numb in their head, and they don't know anything about what God's trying to do in their life. Now, I'm not telling you that sometimes we don't need things. There's times we might need a pain pill. But I'd be very careful letting a doctor put me on something that will take away my soul that I wouldn't be able to spiritually think or physically think. Amen? Drug abuse is drug abuse. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm telling you, I, we've seen it right here in this church. We've seen people get hooked on pain pills, and they do anything to get them. Drive in the middle of the night, do whatever they had to do to get them, they'll, they'll get them. It's the same thing as a drug addict. Amen? He wants to control our life, not us. He wants us to be separated unto Him and not us taking things in our own hands. Amen. Don't you think children ought to hear that? They're fixing to go to school and some of them's in school. Some of them are facing it every day. We've got folks sitting right here in this room that, that need to hear that, that. That drugs is not the answer. Alcohol is not the answer. God is the answer. Lester Roloff, when he had the girls home and the, and the boys home, he wouldn't even let them take an aspirin. He said, the only pill you need is the gospel. And I'm going to tell you something. He had a good bunch of kids who loved the Lord and sung for the Lord and lived for the Lord. Amen. We don't have to have the things of this world. We don't have to seek the word of this world. We have his word. He's got his own word. It's the King James Bible, and that's the word that we need to seek. Amen. We don't have to sit down in some doctor's office and him tell us that God is dead and all that stuff, and we don't need. Uh, we, listen, our God's alive. Amen. I don't have to seek the approval of any man. I have his approval. I'm, the Bible says I'm accepted in the beloved. And folks, we don't. Listen, these kids are fixing to go to school again this year, already in school. And they're seeking the, the approval of their peers. And so that, Brother Don, you remember school, that puts pressure on you to do things that's not right. But you live for Him. There's a little spider. I never heard of this. I was, as I was studying, I come across this little spider. Have you all ever heard of a water spider? You fix them to. You know where they live? They live in mud puddles. And what they do is they'll get up on the top of the water and they'll blow out some air real quick and it blows a bubble up around them. Honest. And then they'll sink down to the bottom of that mud hole and live down there as long as the air lasts. And when the air goes out, they go, come back up and they'll cause another bubble and they'll go down. And you know what? They live amongst all that mud and dirt and filth and never get dirty. We can live in this world 
and not be dirty. Amen? We can live in this present world. He said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. Has anybody ever heard of a man named Stuart Hamblin? Glenn's old enough. He remembers him. As he lived in the 30s. Uh, <laughs> Stuart Hamblin was a, a TV Western star. Some, you know, the old singing, y'all don't remember them, but the old black and white singing Western. And he wrote terrible songs. I can't go hunting with Jake, but I can go chasing women. He wrote that song. And uh, he was a drinker, and he just lived for this world. An evangelist came to town. He put him on the radio show because his daddy was a preacher. And he asked that preacher, he said, can I come by your hotel and talk to you? And he did. He got saved. Stuart Hamlin got saved at that evangelist motel room. Later on, after his life had changed, he ran into John Wayne. John Wayne said, I heard you've turned your life around. He said, well, it's no secret that God has done things in my life. He said, well, that's pretty snappy. Make a song out of that. And he wrote, it is no secret what God can do. What he'll do for others, he'll do for you. We don't have to live in a smutty world and be smutty with it. We can be separated. We can, we can go without the gate, without the camp, and bear his reproach. We live in this world, and we have to. Brother Jeremy, you've got to go to work. Sheila wants, you know, you to bring home the bacon. And so you've got to go to work, and guess what? But you can go there and be like that little water spider. You can blow that bubble up around you and be separated. You don't have to tell dirty jokes. You don't have to listen to their music. You don't have to gamble. You don't have to drink. You don't have to do drugs. You do that because you want to. You do it what you, well, you do what you want to. <laughs> How about you? Do you want to be separate? Do you want to be a peculiar people? Living for God, telling the truth. Let me ask you another question. Do you want these kids to be separate and to live for God? Or would you like for them at the age of 16 to already be on meth and drugs? Would you like for them at the age of 16 to already be messed up in their life morally and pure, purity and all that stuff? Would you like for that to happen? No one here would like for that, that to happen. And you say, Brother Steve, I'm already separated. Well, listen. Could you not bear a few sermons every now and then so we might raise up a, a group of kids that realizes it's not wrong to live for God. It's not a mocking matter to live for God. And let them mock on. Let them, let them laugh at me. I'm going to tell you what. I lived, my life was wicked. I, I, I don't want to even go into all that I did. But I, I went to school with a fella. We ran into him the other day. His name's Sam Baldwin. And he lived for the Lord when he was in high school. He used to witness to me. He used to witness to me. And I wouldn't have none of it. We, we ridiculed him, made his life terrible. And I ran into him here last year. And I told him, I said, Sam, I want to thank you for living your life in front of me. You were one of the witnesses that showed me. It don't matter if it's high school. It don't matter where it's at. You can live for the Lord. Amen. I worked with a fellow. I worked with a fellow. I would tease him till that boy would cry. I mean, that's how mean I was. I'd tell him he cussed and all kinds of stuff, and he didn't. When I got saved, I found him, and I, I, I almost got on my knees and said, I need you to forgive me. I was terrible and mean to you. He said, I'm just glad you got saved. <laughs> we can live in this world and be separate. Church can be separate. The children can be separate. And we can live a separated life. It's not a list of rules that, that I have for you. But, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a list of things that God wants us to throw away. Get them out of our life. Because he's got something better for us. Amen. Don't you think the ways of God is better than the ways of the world? His music's better. His, his, his life is better. His quality of life is better. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. If you're here and you're not saved tonight.
Can I tell you Jesus loves you? Jesus loves you. He wants you to be saved tonight. He wants you to come tonight and be saved. He wants you to trust Him by faith. You ought to step out right now and do that. And if you're here tonight and you are saved, you ought to come to this altar and say, Lord, I'm here for me. I want to live a separated life. I'm here for these kids. I want them to live a separated life. I'm here for the church. I want the church to live a separated life that we might bear his reproach. Would you come tonight and say, Lord, help us? How about you? How about you? I don't want one child in this church to be on drugs. I don't want one child in this church to be drinking. I don't want one child in this church to get into the ways of this world. I would, I would like for them to live separated. How about you? Would you come? How about you tonight? Somebody tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, I've been living with one foot in and one foot out. And I want to come tonight and put both feet in. How about you? I tell you what, God knows where you've been living. Your children know where you've been living. Somebody needs to come. You need, you're not saved. Y'all to come. pray that through the, the preaching of God's word and God's, God's special instruction that kids will get saved here and break that chain of going through that terrible life and uh, having to live. You know what? I lived a terrible life. For 29 years I lived a terrible life. It was terrible. I've got scars in my mind I wish I could get rid of. I can't get rid of them. And every now and then the devil knows how to turn a light on somewhere and, and, and those scars be revealed. If we could ever get them where they don't ever have those scars, we're accomplishing something. Amen.